So about a year ago, I reviewed a little game called Ratchet and Clank. I'm sure you've all heard of the franchise by now. It's been around for 20 years. And while I did grow up with the game, and I still enjoy it to this day, it was somewhat flawed. It makes sense to a degree why they remade the game, even though that's one of the worst remakes ever made. But that's a subject for another video. It seems to me like Insomniac was aware of the flaws of the first game, namely the gameplay mechanics, because Ratchet and Clank Going Commando is one of the greatest sequels of all time. And no, that's not a clickbait title, this really is, to this day, probably the best Ratchet and Clank game. Although, I'll admit, I'm still partial to Up Your Arsenal. I really like the story and the sort of superhero slant to things because it was released far before cape shit movies dominated the public consciousness and the Marvel Cinematic Universe hadn't even started yet. But again, I am getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about Up Your Arsenal in a future video, I'm sure. Today, we're going to talk about a sequel that truly understands what it means to be one. And when people ask me, especially when I review subpar Ubisoft games, what exactly are my standards for a sequel? This game is the perfect example of what somebody should expect out of one. It improves all the aspects of the previous game and innovates with new mechanics. And pretty much every Ratchet & Clank sequel in the following 15 plus years followed this game's formula to a T barely improving on it because they did it so right with the second entry. But before I go into this further, do the things the algorithm likes because, well, this is a retrospective, so it's going to get much less views than, say, a modern video game or TV show review. I really appreciate it. And without further ado, let's talk about why Ratchet & Clank Going Commando is the greatest in the series. Honestly, I don't even know where to begin with this game because there's so many things I like about it. But I'll do what I always do and start with the gameplay mechanics first. Now, I'm not going to cover all of them again as I did in the first video. And they're not too much different here. Once you rescue Clank, you have all of the same abilities you had at the end of the last one. There's no Metroidvania-style revoking of all of your powers at the beginning, though of course you do lose all of your weapons. So that means you have access to the Helipack, the O2 Mask, the Hydro Pack, pretty much all the basic movement abilities that you had. But immediately what you'll notice is different is now you can strafe at any time. While the first game technically did have a strafe feature, it was awful, completely useless, honestly. But now in Going Commando, you can strafe at any time by holding L2. And if you jump while moving, you do a side flip or a back flip to avoid attacks. This is an incredibly simple change, but it drastically increases the skill ceiling and just generally the smoothness of gameplay. And you can say that for the rest of the controls as well, the game just moves a lot smoother. The next thing you'll notice is that most of the weapons have an auto-aim feature of some kind. If you're facing the general direction of the enemy, there will be a green reticle on that enemy, and obviously whatever gun you're using will shoot at that spot. Now, if you've played any of the newer titles, you'll notice they did eventually evolve into full third-person shooters where you actually do have to aim manually with the right analog stick just like any other shooter. But honestly, I didn't have a single problem with the auto-aim because these are not necessarily supposed to be skill-based games. They're just supposed to be fun. I think it completely works. I understand why they changed it eventually, because you can only make the same game so many times. Unfortunately, this series did eventually stagnate horribly, even though all of them are pretty fun games, and if you're curious, I'll give you my thoughts on Rift Apart at the end, as I did play it a few months ago. But to get back to going commando, this standard of movement and shooting started with this game, and obviously was good enough that they used it for the next decade with very little changes between entries. Probably the most significant and substantial change in the series that once again started with this game is the ability of your weapons to get more powerful as you use them, which is pretty self-explanatory. You kill enemies with that gun, it gets experience, and eventually it turns into a much more powerful version of the same gun. And I'm not gonna spend the next five minutes describing every gun even though I do have a habit in these videos sometimes to just drone on and list things off. For the sake of the viewer, I'm just going to name a few of my favorites. 
The most obvious is the Bouncer. This is probably the most popular gun in the entire series as it's shown up in four separate entries at this point. So you probably already know what this weapon does if you've played Ratchet and Clank, but in case you don't, it basically shoots a big ball that big ball explodes, and then a bunch of smaller balls come out that chase people, and then those balls explode. It's a very simple concept, but incredibly satisfying. It shot for shot probably does the most damage out of every other standard gun in the game. And you get access to it just halfway into the game. So you can use this thing all the way to the end. And of course, the upgraded version shoots a bigger ball that explodes into bigger, small, explodey balls. To quickly name off a few other ones I like, you have the mini turret glove, which throws auto turrets that eventually upgrade into shooting rockets out of each of the turrets. And you can throw down multiple at the same time and then shoot guys with another gun so it feels strategic. You have the lava gun, which shoots out a short range stream of lava, and you can jump around or spin, and it'll follow you, so it just kind of feels satisfying to use. Unfortunately, its upgrade works completely differently and more like a normal gun. It shoots out little lava balls, so that's probably the only case where the upgrade actually feels worse than the original version. They actually rectify this and up your arsenal by turning the lava gun into a liquid nitrogen gun when it upgrades. Makes no sense logically, but at least it has that fun, spinny, stream, physics-y aspect to it. Then you have the plasma coil that shoots out a little electric ball that chains lightning to nearby enemies. But then the upgraded version, the Plasma Storm, shoots out a floaty ball that electrifies anything that it floats near. And of course, you can't mention weapons in Ratchet and Clank without talking about the Rhino, the rip you a new one, the most powerful missile launcher in the galaxy. You usually can't afford to buy this in the first playthrough unless you specifically cripple yourself for the majority of the game, and then if you do buy it, you just breeze through that last 10%. For the sequel, this is actually quite a bit more doable, because despite the fact that the price is raised from 150000 to 1 million, inflation has hit the Bogon Galaxy pretty hard because you get probably 2 million bolts over the course of the game, as long as you're doing most of the optional content. So you could certainly avoid buying any guns you don't absolutely need, save up, buy the Rhino, and absolutely destroy the rest of the game. So in the first game, the Rhino was a massive rocket launcher that fired 9 round bursts and could fire 50 times, which was more than enough to destroy anything in the game, even the final boss, without running out of ammo. In the second game, the fittingly named Rhino 2 is a fully automatic missile launcher that can lock onto pretty much every target on screen at the same time, but fires individual rockets with very little homing ability. That said, the rate of fire is so fast, and it does so much damage per shot, that it completely trivializes the game possibly even more than the first Rhino. Even though it only has 100 total rounds, you can find ammo for it in ammo crates, meaning that you probably never have to switch weapons after you've obtained this thing. And it scratches that god mode itch that these weapons always should. It's just all pretty fun stuff. All the guns have very simple functions. Not all of them are all that useful or powerful or practical, and some of them are overpriced, admittedly. 
but there's not a single useless weapon in this game. They're all useful for something, and if you don't like the overly goofy weapons for some reason, which I don't know why you wouldn't, that's the whole appeal of this series, but in case you didn't, there are standard guns, like an assault rifle, shotgun, rocket launcher, sniper, on top of the more wacky shit. Now honestly, just having the weapons upgrade as a progression system would have been enough of an improvement for most modern developers, but Insomniac didn't stop there. On top of your weapons upgrading, your health also upgrades as you kill enemies, and there are hidden extra health upgrades in various parts of the levels, similar to the gold bolts in the first game, and speaking of which, there are now platinum bolts spread across the levels, and instead of buying gold versions of the weapons, you use these bolts to purchase weapon mods, these mods being usually a lock-on mod and either an acid or shock mod. Now unfortunately those are the only types of mods, but having another way to upgrade your weapons is certainly a good idea, feels satisfying, and makes those platinum bolts still feel useful, which unfortunately they become less and less useful over the course of the series. And then you have the final type of progression, which is armor. Every few planets you get access to another armor set, which decreases the damage you take by a set percentage. These become incredibly important, if you don't have the latest armor, you're gonna take a shit ton of damage per hit, and it becomes very noticeable. This is not a hard game, but this was the most difficult game in the series before they started adding difficulty settings, because it has certain expectations of what weapons you'll have, and what armor you'll have for certain planets, so if you're not doing enough of the optional content, you might be a bit behind and get your ass handed to you. Which, honestly, I welcome any sort of challenge for these games. They can certainly feel a bit too easy at times. So, all in all, the gameplay mechanics are pretty much an improvement across the board. I really have no complaints here. While obviously they tweak them in some of the later games to be a bit more refined and add some skill in the case of actual manual aiming, this is still a perfectly fun game to play even today. Now as for the level design, this is a bit more of a side grade, but that's mostly just because the first game already did this pretty well. You're still traveling across the galaxy visiting different planets, though a different galaxy this time. But the general vibe of the levels has changed, where the first game feels more like a space adventure where you're sort of exploring all these different biomes and you meet these wacky characters. Going Commando keeps some of that, but because of the change to more action level design, the levels are a little bit more linear, corridor-like, to better set up enemy encounters. And a lot of the locations have a sort of similar sci-fi or cyberpunkish, overly industrialized vibe to them. Over the course of the game, you visit a lot of futuristic cities, abandoned factories, military complexes, that sort of thing, you're not really fighting the wildlife much anymore. Which is fine because it more fits the theme of the game, as in the Bogon Galaxy, a mega corporation literally called Megacorp has taken over all forms of manufacturing and has polluted planets, experimented and tortured animals, and is exploiting the common man. Ratchet & Clank was never very subtle about its commentary, but it fits the 90s cartoon sense of humor that these games used to have. Now, let's get the goods on that experiment. What the? I think I see the problem. What? Now even the computers are charging us? That's it. This galaxy blows. But because the visual aesthetic is a little bit more standardized, the game definitely loses a little bit of the atmosphere that the first game excelled at, but this has been replaced with much more compelling combat as I covered earlier, and also a very large variety of side activities that constantly keeps the pacing at this perfect level where you never get bored while playing the game. Roughly every 15 minutes you're going to engage in some sort of alternative activity that isn't just shooting people. It would take way too long to cover these all in detail, so I'll just list off all of the different mini-games and various other gameplay that you engage in over the course of the game. We've got space battles, gladiator arenas, 
puzzle sections with the tractor beam and terminator. We've got platforming sections with the swing shot and rail grinding like the first game, but also the dynamo, a new gadget which put quite simply creates holographic platforms. We got hoverboard races, two different hacking minigames which are both pretty good, a glider which is pretty self-explanatory, giant clank boss battles, the levitator which is basically a jetpack, and the hypnomatic which lets you control robots. That is a lot of gameplay variety for a roughly 10 to 12 hour game. And the space battles specifically actually have a decent amount of depth to them. They easily could have expanded on this in a sequel, made it even more engaging. Unfortunately, they never did. The arenas are pretty great. It's yet another feature that has been in every game since Going Commando. For obvious reasons, if the gunplay is fun, then obviously you want to shoot more guys. And given that most of the linear levels are only 10 to 15 minutes long, which is another reason why the pacing is so good, these arenas give you an extended roughly hour of content each that allow you to fight various different challenges, either requiring you to kill a certain amount of enemies in a certain time, or defeating a unique boss, or surviving a certain amount of waves of enemies, and sometimes they combine all these things together. The sad part is about the arenas is that only Up Your Arsenal attempted to expand these. I feel like starting with Tools of Destruction, they got pretty lazy and most of these are just a circular, tiny little arena where they spawn waves of enemies and occasionally they'll change it up by maybe having some hazards or having lava, but they all make the same mistake that after Deadlocked, all the arenas are too small. Part of what made them fun is that they had a shit ton of enemies on screen and the camera was zoomed out so that you could actually see most of them. But modern gaming, specifically Sony games for some reason, has this cancerous close-up third-person camera where you can't see behind yourself, which completely defeats the point of a third-person camera if you ask me. It's something that everybody complained about with God of War, and now Ratchet & Clank has been getting more and more zoomed in with each entry it feels like. Why can't you just do what you did before and try and improve on that? Another thing that you'll probably remember if you played this game is the impossible challenge. Obviously being the hardest arena challenge, it is a 60 round endurance challenge where you get no health packs the entire time. And so the only health refills you get are from nanotech upgrades. And, of course, at the end of the 60 rounds, you do have to fight the Megapede, a boss that drops homing mines all over the arena, and every time you hit him, he splits off a piece of his body that has a turret on it, so it turns into a little bit of a bullet hell type of thing. And despite being 60 rounds, each round is less than 30 seconds. It only took me 20 minutes to fight my way all the way through it. And all in all, it's very satisfying, rewards you with 200,000 bolts which unfortunately doesn't go very far by this point in the game, but you'll at least be able to afford a cool gun. As for most of these other side activities, they're not really worth discussing in detail. I will say I don't like the hoverboard races. They're way too bland. And all of the optional challenges for money are pretty much the same race, except for the last one where the AI starts cheating. And speaking of cheating, if you blow up at any point in the race, even if you're 10 seconds ahead of the AI, they will spawn in front of you as soon as you respawn. So even though they're pretty easy, if you ever blow up at any point, you could fuck up the entire thing. But for the most part, I'd say gameplay variety is definitely good, whether it's the gliding or the jetpacking or these giant clank boss fights, all that's pretty fun. If I had to have one general complaint, but it is a very minor nitpick, is that the game at its worst does remind me a bit of Spyro 3 or Banjo-Tooie, where you're spending too much of the time not actually playing the game. At least the core gameplay of strafing, side jumping, shooting, enemies, upgrading, all that. And there's also two levels in the game that are kind of inexcusable. You might know exactly what I'm talking about already. But there's a desert planet and an ice planet, where you have to collect 100 crystals each. Now you don't have to do this, it's purely for money. In terms of the story, you only have to collect 10 on the first and 25 on the second. But the first one is just plain boring, it's a huge empty desert landscape. And the second one is a frozen tundra that's much more compact, but has the worst fucking enemies in the entire game. This is way harder than the rest of the game for no reason. These yetis have more health than any other basic enemy type in the game, and there can be over 20 of them on screen at once. 
And then you have to kill all of these huge sea serpents with ice beams that are giant bullet sponges as well. And you're just gonna die over and over again. Sometimes from the stupidest shit, because if you fall in any of these ice puddles, you die instantly. And it's fucking awful, it's just awful, man. I've probably beaten this game like 10 times, and because I'm a bit of a completionist, I've probably collected all the crystals from these two levels every time, and I hate it every time. Even though realistically it only takes about 45 minutes for each level, it feels like an eternity. This is rock bottom for this game. I would not recommend doing it unless you have to 100% it. But basically the takeaways from the level design are, this game is extremely well paced. This is something sorely missing from every modern game, and part of the reason I look like I'm dead inside every time I play one of those games on stream, because every goddamn modern game feels like it has to have a tutorial at least an hour long, with several cutscenes that are each as long as your average Metal Gear cutscene. For no reason, it adds nothing. It's not like a dramatic moment. No, it's just to make everything feel like a goddamn movie, and a shitty movie at that. This game's cutscenes are all like less than a minute long, and either get the point across quickly, or tell a relatively funny joke. I'm usually not a fan of humor in video games. I fucking hate the Borderlands style of humor with a passion. But at least the classic Ratchet and Clank games can get me to crack a smile. Attention all thugs for less employees. First of all, whatever slug brain's been eating all the choochy bars in the break room, better quit stuffing his face. Hello? Hey, turn those lights off! It's bad feng shui. Ahem. <clears throat> Next, our space rendezvous point has been moved to, and listen up, knuckleheads, the Felsen system in sector one, two, three, four, five. If you're no good with numbers, find a buddy to help you. But to get back to the pacing thing, over the course of an hour in Horizon Forbidden West, I wasn't even finished with the fucking tutorial yet. In this game, by the end of an hour, I had beaten the tutorial and the first two levels, including the entire arena section. That is a huge fucking difference, guys. The amount of stuff I felt like I did, I feel like I'd accomplished so much more, and I understand this is completely subjective. But not every game has to be super slow paced. Why do they do this? This is why I don't like story in video games anymore. People wonder why I say that. It's because it distracts from the gameplay, usually in more ways than one. So again, another point to this game. The cutscenes are short, get the point across. The levels are very fast paced and they constantly throw new activities at you. So they never get annoying or boring because everything is fast, and you're constantly doing a new thing. And to mention yet another improvement this game made over the first, if you'll remember, in that first game, there was New Game Plus, but the only thing that it added was the rest of the gold weapons. Everything else was the same, it was a standard New Game Plus mode. Now starting with this game, and is also in every other game in the series, is Challenge Mode. It works the same as New Game Plus from the previous games, but it is also simultaneously a new higher difficulty level and adds in the Mega Weapons, which are basically stronger versions of the guns you already have that you have to purchase that cost substantially more bolts than they did in the base game. And to make up for this, there's a Bolt Multiplier. For every enemy that you kill without getting hit, it slowly builds up a multiplier to times 20. And if you can maintain that times 20 for a long time, you're gonna make a shit ton of bolts pretty fast. And you're pretty much required to get these mega weapons. Even your strongest guns from the previous playthrough are borderline useless even on early game enemies. But because all of the mega weapons are unlocked from the start, at least for all the guns that you have upgraded from the base playthrough, you have much more player freedom and can choose whatever gun you'd like and you likely never bought the Rhino 2 in your first playthrough, and a million bolts really doesn't take long to get with a times 20 bolt multiplier. So you can quickly save up for it, buy it, and lo and behold, it's still overpowered even in challenge mode. But challenge mode is always pretty fun, it gives you a real reason to play the game again, and I'm glad it's still stuck around even to this day. So I guess the last element of the game to talk about is the story. This is probably the only part of the game I would say is a significant downgrade from the first. But the first is also the only game in the entire series I'd say actually has a compelling story. 
maybe with up your arsenal as a distant second. Part of the problem is this game sort of soft retcons Ratchet and Clank's characters, and they never actually grow as characters from this point forward. To give you a bit of a refresher, in the first game, Ratchet was kind of an asshole. I know that's an oversimplification, and to some degree he is justified in exploding on Clank when Quark betrays them. But let's just say Ratchet was certainly self-centered. He just wanted to go on his grand adventure in the galaxy because he was sick of being stuck on his home planet. But when the galaxy is in danger and Ratchet and Clank are clearly the only heroes qualified to save everyone, Ratchet follows a traditional hero's journey path and rejects the call to action, but eventually turns around, you know, yada yada, basic storytelling. Whereas Clank represents the trope of the robot who slowly learns human emotion and behavior over the course of the story. There's so many examples of this in media that it's probably a waste of time to mention them. And so they both kind of grow as characters over the course of the story. But now, in Going Commando, the roles have almost reversed, where Clank is a bit of a smartass in this game. Though he's still pretty diplomatic with new NPCs, at least when talking to Ratchet, he's definitely a bit sassy himself, though not in a mean way. And Ratchet is a bit more of a nebulous, kind of hard to define character. I guess you could say he's carefree, laid back, maybe a little overconfident but I'd certainly say he's more of a generic hero character from this point forward. And honestly, even before you notice the character change, you'll notice the change in voice actor, as from this point forward in the series, he's voiced by James Arnold Taylor, which most people will know for his role as the voice of Obi-Wan in all of the animated Star Wars shows. And while it's certainly jarring at first to hear the new voice because it's so different from the first game, Look, that lieutenant doesn't seem so tough. Let's take him out ourselves. We just saw a video of your experiment eating its handlers. I repeat, it eats its handlers. This is also the voice everyone's heard for like 18 years. So you adjust to it pretty quickly and it fits Ratchet's new personality. So to summarize Ratchet and Clank's new dynamic is more like two best friends who will stick with each other to the end, but poke fun at each other from time to time. You know, usual male friendship stuff. And honestly, I think this works just fine as a dynamic, but it's certainly not as well defined as, say, Jack and Daxter, where Jack is the serious, stoic one and Daxter is the jokey one. As for the story itself, this is certainly the weakest part of the game. It is just not that interesting. It's very simple. The twist is heavily foreshadowed. And honestly, just not that many things actually happen because most of the plot events are just a vehicle for the comedy. To summarize it very briefly, after the first game, Ratchet and Clank retire and slowly fade into obscurity over time, when suddenly one day they're hired by Mr. Fizzwidget, the president of Megacorp from the Bogon Galaxy, to recover his stolen experiment from some unknown thief character. So over the course of the game, you're chasing down this thief, Ratchet has to rescue Clank at one point, and then about a third of the way through the game, you defeat this mysterious thief, recover the experiment, deliver it to Fizzwidget, he betrays you, which in a complete role reversal, Clank immediately suspects they're betrayed and Ratchet is the one who gives Fizzwidget the benefit of the doubt. But it's pretty obvious to the audience at this point that he was using you the whole time. Then directly after this, the thief reveals himself to be Angela Cross, another Lombax, Get ready for that to be soft retconned in a couple games, and then unretconned the game after that. And she reveals that she used to work for Megacorp, and that this experiment was deeply flawed and basically was a homicidal maniac creature that can reproduce at will asexually. And so for the rest of the game, you're trying to catch up to Fizzwidget, find out if he betrayed you, which he obviously did, and it's heavily foreshadowed across three different cutscenes that Mr. Fizzwidget is actually Captain Quark. I feel like pretty much everyone will have guessed this by the end of the game because they make it very obvious, trust me. I realize these games are rated teen, so I suppose they did it for kids, but it kind of defeats the point of a twist if you give away the twist multiple times. 
But before this reveal, Ratchet and Clank travel to the planet Bolden, and I'm actually going to derail this synopsis for a second to talk about how great this level is. It's got to be the best one in the game. After an intro sequence where you use the levitator to fly against rows of traffic, the rest of the level is a surprising difficulty jump from the previous ones, with thugs for less goons using these plasma snipers, and they hide behind metal rows of cover that you can actually destroy, and the level design itself uses the now improved gravity boots, which actually allow you to move and jump freely on any surface, to stick to the sides of buildings and shoot thugs that pop out of windows, and there's magnetic spirals for some reason, which is just really cool visually and gameplay-wise, as you blast the thugs straight off into the abyss. It's pretty much got everything I want out of a Ratchet & Clank level. Good level design, some gameplay variety, some actual challenge, which like I mentioned earlier is fairly rare. And it doesn't go on for too long, like most of the other levels, it's about 15 minutes though possibly much longer if you die over and over again. And it gives you secret access to the Insomniac Museum, basically a little developer room where they talk about things that were cut from the games and, and stuff like that. And of course, at the end of this level, it was all a trap. There's a fizz widget robot waiting for you and you're kidnapped by the Thugs for Less boss and sent to a surprisingly cushy prison, which you break out of with the help of a little robot girl who's obviously set up to be Clank's girlfriend and find out Angela was kidnapped by the Thugs for Less boss. So you track him down to his headquarters, have a giant robot boss battle, and discover that Fizz Widget is planning to unleash the Protopet. Wait, say again? Protopet? Oh, yeah, it's what they're calling the experiment now. On an unsuspecting planet. Of course, our heroes are always a step behind the villain, and he's already unleashed it on the planet Demosel. And so, of course, you make your way there, fight off hundreds of these things that can multiply within seconds. Definitely another highlight of the game, for sure. And eventually, Angela tracks down her old employee card, which still works at the Megacorp HQ for some reason. And you get the big reveal. <laughs> this is bad. All right, just what the f is going on? Captain Quark kills Clank's girlfriend robot, and he reveals his plan was to travel to a new galaxy where he could find a completely new fan base that has never heard of him, and he can save them from a galactic threat and become a hero again. Well, of course, he fucks it up, and the main protopet turns into a giant monster, eats him, you fight the thing in a final boss battle that is insultingly easy compared to a lot of the rest of the game. And the monster throws up Captain Quark and he survives, obviously. And we get our happy ending with Ratchet hanging out with Angela, who I guess is his girlfriend. And he also fixes Clank's girlfriend. Which would have been a perfect ending for the series, I guess, except they literally foreshadow in this game that a sequel was in development. There you go, pal. See you in another year or so. What did he mean by that? But yeah, I hate to repeat myself too many times, but the story just isn't really that good. But it doesn't really matter because it's not so much about the story, it's about all the crazy characters you meet over the course of the game. Like the Thugs for Less boss, who's obviously a moron. The biker gang that's full of sissies. And I'm gonna avoid listing off a bunch of things again, but you get the point. Everything's just a setup for some late 90s to early 2000s era cartoon style of humor, and it just works. Even the worst elements of this game are still pretty decent at the end of the day. And so in conclusion, yes, this is probably the best Ratchet and Clank game. I still love Up Your Arsenal, there's a lot of elements of it that I think it does better than this game. But I can't deny this is the most innovative entry in the series easily and it still does certain things better than even the modern entries in the series almost 20 years later. And I think anybody with even a slight interest in the action platformer genre should play this game. If you enjoyed Jack and Daxter or Sly Cooper growing up but never played Ratchet and Clank, this is the one I would recommend to anybody. Even though I think you should probably start most series with the first entry, you could skip to this one and you're really not missing that much. And so, since I didn't really get an opportunity to review it when it came out, I will give my thoughts on Rift Apart really briefly. 
I think ultimately this is just another generic entry in the series, very similar to Tools of Destruction, Crack in Time, Into the Nexus. With some of the worst elements of the 2016 remake, I'll admit, including reusing a bunch of enemy types, what is it with modern games not understanding that enemy variety is so important? Even back to the very first entry in the series, and certainly Going Commando as well, every single level in the game has at least one new enemy type. And even though Ratchet and Clank games are not the longest games usually, they're around 10 hours on average, Rift Apart feels even shorter because so much of that length is cutscenes. And I'm sorry, the story's just not that engaging. I have no reason to be invested in Rivet or Kit because they're just alternate universe versions of Ratchet and Clank. And the problem with alternate universes in general is that they're usually one-offs. And I realize Rivet is pretty popular, but for the wrong reason. This series avoided appealing to the furries for almost 20 years and they finally gave in. So we might actually see her again, but it's gonna feel incredibly forced, I guarantee it. And honestly, I don't even like Ratchet & Clank's characters anymore post-Tools of Destruction, so... Why should I care about the story when it's incredibly predictable and the characters are not compelling? The only thing I really found interesting about the universe was Emperor Nefarious, even though he's basically just the Giga Chad version of Dr. Nefarious and just makes him look like a beta male the entire game, which is kind of funny at first, but then gets a little annoying by the end. And I feel like Dr. Nefarious period is just an overused character, even though he's certainly my favorite villain in the series, he's not the only good one. And this whole game sort of has a B-team vibe to it. Obviously the A-team is working on Spider-Man 2, because that's where the money's at, that's what all the normies want to buy, but I'm a Ratchet and Clank fan far more than I am of any other series Insomniac made afterward. Though I really did like Sunset Overdrive and it's a shame that it bombed horribly. That being said, I do like the improvements to the skill ceiling in this game. Like I said, it has manual aiming like a couple of the other entries have had. It added a Dark Souls dodge, which I'll admit I'm kind of sick of seeing in other games, but I think it works for this. And the weapon selection was pretty good, though it's a shame that the Pixelizer and Bouncer were only in challenge mode. So long story short, I think it was a pretty decent game, certainly not a system seller by any stretch of the imagination, and it still doesn't even touch the PS2 era of Ratchet and Clank. I'd say it's about slightly below crack in time. Certainly worth playing if you can get it at like half price, but man, I feel like almost every Sony studio has forgotten what makes video games fun because I'm so fucking sick of there being so much focus put on cutscenes or story, especially when it's not even that good. And then the gameplay is basically the same thing, or arguably a downgrade from previous entries. So on that note, play Ratchet & Clank Going Commando if you can. As of right now, the only ways of playing it as far as I know are either the original PS2 version, the PS3 remaster which is kinda buggy. I don't feel like going over it in this video, but there are a lot of annoying minor bugs in that remaster. Or you could emulate it, which I've heard the emulation for Ratchet & Clank is not as good because of some rendering issue or something. I'll admit I've never tried. Now, it could be coming to this PS Plus Ultimate thing that Sony is supposedly releasing this month, but as of right now, there is no official announcement. But it is absolutely worth your time if you can play it. So you should definitely check it out. This is probably the closest thing you're going to get to a synthetic man seal of quality on a game. It says, in case of emergency, break glass with wrench. Hold on. This one says, use rock to break glass to get wrench to break glass to get rock. Ooh, I love logic puzzles. Let's see, if you break the glass with the... Solved it. <laughs>